Well, this morning we are continuing with our third of our three-part series, Who We Are and Where We Are Going. These messages are designed to really head us and direct us as we enter into a new era here at TCF. As we begin our study, um, I would like, if it would be okay, I'd like to pray with you and then we're going to jump right in. So please bow your heads with me as we go before the Lord. I'm a great, most gracious heavenly father. We humbly and gratefully bow our hearts before you this morning, asking that this study, the contents of our time together this morning, would really grip each one of us afresh, anew, Each of the three points, the three pillars that we've discussed are all grounded in your word and are all important. But this, this morning, is the gospel. This is of utmost importance. If we get this wrong, we get the whole thing wrong. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to understand the depths, the intricacies, the richness that is in the gospel. Father, we love you. We exalt you. We give thanks for your son, our redeemer, our savior. And we pray now that as we, again, step into your word, that you would use your spirit to convict us, to encourage us, and to bless us. Thank you for this time. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I'm just going to read a verse to you. Proverbs 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained, but happy is he who keeps the law. Now, this proverb is speaking of really the lack of the truth, the lack of God's word in the lives of people. When people are not guided, shepherded, instructed, counseled with the scriptures. It leads to all sorts of decisions and and movements that are contrary to God's will. This is true in a person's personal life, and this is true in the church. So as Christ's church, we must be careful to adhere ourselves to the scriptures and let them guide us. And I believe that's what we've done exactly precisely with our mission statement. You can see up in front of you our missions, well, really sort of our building blocks of ministry. Now, the handout, you can see it begins with the very bottom with principles. Uh, That's the most essential, the most important. That's where everything begins, and really it's the word of God. Those are the principles that we begin. That's where we start. The first and greatest commandment is to love God. The second is to love people, which takes us into our next building block, People. Here we have God, we have the saints, and we have the lost. Those are whom we minister to. Um, Those are the people that we focus upon. Next is purpose. And that is really sort of the thrust of what we're doing over these last three weeks. Um, Today being the final week, we exalt God, we edify the saints, and we evangelize the lost. Those are our purposes. That's what we are to be about. Uh, I would say that those are so deep, but yet broad enough that that's what every church is to be about. That's what every Christian is to be about. We are to exalt God, edify one another, and bring the gospel to a dead and lost world. The others... Priorities, problems, programs, property. Those are all parts of the building blocks, but those are less important um, than the earlier three. But they are still important. 
And in time, we probably will come back around to this and address those other areas as well. But this is where we want to camp. This is where we need to stay today. So the mission statement of TCS has three pillars. The first pillar is TCF. We exist to exalt God through worshiping him in our everyday lives and activities by the empowering of the Holy Spirit. We talked in depth about that the first week, but our desire is to lift God high. And we desire to live lives of worship, living in the presence of God all the time, knowing that he is always there. Wherever we are, he is present. And our desire is to glorify him wherever we are, whatever we're doing at every moment of every day. The second pillar, we at TCF exist to edify the saints in accordance with God's word through personal holiness, mutual discipleship, and loving service. The idea to edify is to, to build, to encourage one another. We are God's church, and we are commanded to pour our lives into one another for the building up of one another and ultimately the building up of God's church. And we do that through first and foremost personal holiness. We, as individuals and corporately, we need to be godly. We all fall short. And we have a redeemer who forgives and has forgiven. And in the eyes of God, through Christ, we are seen as pure, clean, white, sinless, but in all practicality, we know we, we, are, we, are, we are filthy. But personal holiness is of tremendous importance, and we need to commit ourselves to that. And where we fall short, we repent. And where we fall short, we go to our brothers and sisters, um, and we ask for help. We ask for wisdom. We ask for counsel. We ask for accountability. Next to personal holiness is mutual discipleship. We need one another. We do not live on an island. We were never intended to. Personal, mutual discipleship is essential for the church. Next is loving service. In that mutual discipleship, in our own personal holiness, we need to be committed to loving and caring for one another by serving one another. We talked about last week that that, that most pri well, primarily takes place in, in, in regard to the use and the, ad the administration of our spiritual gifts. How are we doing? Are we using our gifts? We need to be. But loving service obviously can take other forms as well. Um, as many things as you can think of in regard to service, those are the things we need to be doing for one another. Now, pillar three, the final pillar of our mission statement is towards the lost and has to do with the gospel. We must explain the gospel to them whenever the Lord gives us opportunity. Paul in Romans 1 verse 14 says, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarian, both to the wise and to the foolish. The word for obligation can be defined as debtor. Paul understood that first and foremost, he was indebted to God to bring the gospel to the lost. It is not an option for Paul. He owes the unbelieving the gospel. Therefore, this same truth is yours and mine. Evangelism towards the lost is not an option. It is commanded and we must obey. In regard to the actual statement, here it is. TCF exists to evangelize the lost of this world by faithfully proclaiming the life-changing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll read that one more time. TCF exists to evangelize the lost of this world by faithfully proclaiming the life-changing message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Today's message will have four points, um, and I will do my best to keep you on track because there are some sub points, uh, but I will do my best. The four main points are God, 
man, Jesus Christ, and sinner. God, man, Jesus Christ, and sinner. And as we begin, we must first start with the gospel. As I believe I mentioned in my prayer, we have to get the gospel right. If we do not have the gospel right, we ourselves cannot be saved. And in turn, we are just bringing a false message to a dying world. So where it all must start is God. First, you must consider who made you and to whom you are accountable. God created and he owns everything. Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is the first recorded event of God. Out of nothing, ex nihilo, ex nihilo, God created all matter, space, and time. This understanding of the origin of the heavens and the earth is confirmed for us by the author of Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, he says, By faith we understand that the world that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. It all begins with him. Job 38, 4, God refers to himself as laying the very foundations of the world. In Isaiah 42, verse 5, Isaiah states, Thus says the God the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and its offspring, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. Isaiah did not want any confusion confusion concerning which God he was speaking about. He wanted it to be very clear. And in almost the same breath in Isaiah 45, 18, Isaiah says, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens. He is the God who formed the earth and made it. He established it and did not create it a waste place, but formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord and there is none else. There is no misunderstanding. When God created this world, he created all on this world from the very beginning until the very end to acknowledge the fact that he is the creator. He began this all. He created everything. He created this universe and he created all things in it. God being creator also establishes himself as owner. This is important. This is essential. As we bring the gospel to someone, we must help them to see and understand that ownership is part of their being alive and breathing on this globe. We also need to understand that we are not our own. We have been bought with a price. Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and all those who dwell in it. This is not the only reference to universal ownership. Paul repeats this truth in 1 Corinthians 10.26. But in another psalm, Ethan the Ezraite says in Psalm 89.11, the heavens are yours, the earth also is yours, the world and all it contains, you have founded them. One more verse, just to convince you even more. Deuteronomy 10, 14. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. We are not our own. The Lord is over all and he owns all. But God also is perfectly and entirely, utterly holy In the Old Testament, one book that proclaims the holiness of God like no other is the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 
is instructed, I'm sorry, Moses in the book of Leviticus is instructed by God to speak to the Israelites. And he says, speak to all the congregation of the sons of Israel and say to them, you shall be holy for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Now, Israel was a nation created by God and called by him. They were to be set apart people different from all others. And they were to be faithfully committed to him in every way. This means that they were to obey. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26, Thus you are to be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy. And I have set you apart from the peoples to be mine. Now the primary declaration here in this, context, in this passage is that God is holy. Secondarily, you are to be holy also. In this context, holiness refers to being set apart for purity, moral and ceremonial purity. And Jesus echoes this truth as he sets forth the perfect standard in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5:48, therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is without blemish. Humanity, humanity is to be like her God, perfectly holy, without tarnish, without flaw, without stain. Not only is God perfectly holy and demands that you be perfectly holy, God requires perfect obedience to his law. That is the standard. Throughout the Old Testament, the Israelites were continually offering sacrifices for their sin. And as you know, there were over 400 commands in the Old Testament, which the Jews were called to obey at every point. Faithful, God-fearing Jews realized that it was hopeless to expect to be able to honor God the way that God demanded. And this is really no less true today. All that God demands of us is far more than we can accomplish on our own. We are a people who are in desperate need. James sums it up in chapter 2, verse 10. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he has become guilty of all. No matter how obedient we are, we are not perfectly obedient. And I don't know about you, but I, I remember back in, in high school, not knowing the gospel and not being born again, I could always look across the quad and say, but that guy is worse than me. <laughs> now, there weren't many guys I could say that about because I was pretty bad. But there was usually one that provided hope. I clung to that very sincerely. Many people envisioned God sitting at a great scale in the heavens, with God placing every one of their actions on a balance. All the good acts are placed on one side, while the sinful acts are placed on the other. The goal is to keep the scale slightly balanced to the good side. And if someone dies, the scale is tipped in the right direction, then that person would go to heaven. Most of us have either consciously or unconsciously attempted to please God in this way. We have tried to live good lives. We have tried to tip the scales in the right direction. But James refutes this argument and calls it entirely ridiculous. Only one sin in, the, in an entire lifetime would tip the scale the wrong direction. Do we believe that? One transgression in an entire lifetime is enough to tip the scale in the wrong direction. 
We have all broken God's law. We have all sinned and we are all guilty. Before we can even consider to bring the gospel to someone outside the church, we must challenge ourselves with the gospel every day. The gospel is just not the gospel of salvation. The gospel is the gospel of sanctification. The gospel is something that you need to bring to mind daily. When we counsel one another, we bring them the gospel. Why? Because it's the words of eternal life. It's the words of hope. When we're tempted to, to wallow in, in, the, in, in the filth, when we're tempted to, to just wallow in the guilt and shame that we feel for, for whatever sin we commit, the gospel is the key to freedom. Amen. We need it desperately. The church needs the gospel. And some of you know this, that there's been a sort of a, I don't know what the right word, a resurgence, a, a focus on, on, the, on, on the church. And if you go to Christian bookstores, you see it. There's just sort of a refocus on the gospel. We need it. We need the true gospel. We don't need books to tell us that. We should know that. But whatever is going to remind us, we need the gospel. A proper, under the, a proper understanding of the gospel has to begin with God the Father. It has to begin with God. He is your creator and he owns you. He is perfectly holy and demands that of all mankind, especially his church, And now we must understand man. That's our second point, man. The problem with man is that he has broken God's law. Romans 3.10, there is none righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 1 Corinthians 10.31 tells us to do all things for his glory. All mankind is to seek and to honor his creator and owner. But Paul makes it clear that all have sinned. Each and every one, every person who's ever lived has fallen short. Man has broken God's law and we rightly deserve to pay the eternal penalty for sin. The eternal penalty for sin is not just a moment not just a handful of years, but an eternity in hell. Hell in the Bible is described as a place of eternal fire and darkness, everlasting weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell was not created for mankind, but for angels who created, who were created, but willfully transgressed their creator. When Adam and Eve sinned, it opened the door for sinful men and women to be sent into this place of eternal torment and separation from God. This should help us to understand how seriously God views sin. Sin is not simply a mistake that God can easily overlook. His very nature demands that he does not overlook it. He will not and he can't not. If he does, he is a liar. Sin is rebellion against God. Sin is telling God, I don't care what you say. I know better. And I will do whatever I want to do. Sin is idolatry. It is removing God from his rightful place in your life as king and placing yourself on the throne. This is another example of what we talked about last week as being practical atheism for the Christian. Here is what Paul says about the result of sin. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. The payment of sin, willful or ignorant, purposeful or accidental, is spiritual death. Spiritual death is eternal separation from God in hell. Man has broken God's law and rightly deserves to spend eternity apart from God. 
And in all of this, man can do nothing to fix his situation. The Bible is clear, entirely emphatically clear. Man cannot save himself by his good works. Isaiah 64, 6. Most of you are familiar with this text. For all of us have become like one who is unclean. And all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf. And our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Do you think of your good deeds this way? Apart from Christ? God calls them filthy rags. Our sins offend God, seal our eternal destiny to be apart from him. Our sins separate us from his goodness, his kindness, his mercy. Our sins send us to the worst place we could possibly ever imagine. This is where Jesus Christ enters the scene. And this is where the gospel becomes truly good news. Our next point is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ came to earth as both fully God and sinless man. Amen. Colossians 2.9 For in him all the fullness of de deity dwells in bodily form. Right. Now in, in Greek thought, God or a God taking on human flesh was, was absolutely appalling. Flesh was evil. Flesh was just sinful. But at the incarnation, Jesus took on flesh and yet remained the second person of the triune God. He never laid down his deity, but did refuse to be considered equal with his father for a time. He never set aside his deity, but chose not to exercise certain divine attributes for a time. Colossians 2.9 begins with the words, in him, and speaking of Christ. That phrase is in the emphatic position, meaning Jesus and him alone. Only him. It's exclusive. The term for fullness refers to Jesus having not just divine qualities, but the very essence of God the Father. Amen. In Jesus' humanity, he walked on this earth in perfect harmony with his Father, never sinning and living a faultless and flawless life. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, or tells us that Jesus knew no sin. He is perfect and therefore can function and the only one who can function as a savior for mankind and pay sin's penalty. Jesus, being 100% God and 100% man, demonstrated God's love by dying on the cross to pay sin's penalty. That is good news. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. How rich, how amazing, how heart-wrenching. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24 he himself, speaking of Christ, he bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds, you were healed. Oh, good news. Pastor Greg Gilbert, in his little book, What is the Gospel, says... When Jesus died, it was not the punishment for his own sins that he endured. He didn't have any. It was the punishment for his people's sins. As he hung on the cross at Calvary, Jesus bore all the horrible weight of the sin of God's people, all their rebellion, all their disobedience, 
all their sin fell on his shoulders. And the curse that God had pronounced in Eden, the sentence of death, struck. That is why Jesus cried out in agony, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God, his Father, who is holy and righteous, whose eyes are too pure even to look on evil, looked at his son, saw the sins of his son's people resting on his shoulders, turned away in disgust, and poured out his wrath on his own son. Matthew writes that darkness covered the land for about three hours while Jesus hung on the cross. That was the darkness of judgment, the weight of the Father's wrath falling on Jesus as he bore his people's sins and died in their place. Isaiah prophesied about seven centuries before it happened in Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs, he carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. What is described here is what they call the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. Jesus acted as a substitute for his people, for the church. It is Jesus' dying as a substitute for me and for you. That's what substitutionary atonement is. You should have died. Jesus died in your place. You should have been punished for sin, but instead Christ was punished for you. They were your sins, yet he was wounded for them. They were, they were your rebellious acts, but instead he was the one that was disciplined. Your faults, Jesus' sorrow. And his punishment brings you peace. By his stripes you are healed, his grief means your joy, his death means your life. The gospel is not just Jesus who came to earth in human flesh and died on the cross for sinners, but it is also that he rose from the grave and is alive today. We have to turn to 1 Corinthians 15 to read about the resurrection 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning at verse 3, is it, actually chapter 15 as a whole is the most profound text on the resurrection. But look at verse 3. First Corinthians 15, 3, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. That Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Paul knew the gospel is of first importance. Paul defines the gospel as Christ's perfect, perfect and sinless death, Christ's burial, Christ's resurrection from the dead. These things happened just as the Hebrew scriptures said they would. And for references, maybe for you to look up later, Psalm 1610. Isaiah 53, 10 through 12. Jonah 117. The resurrection. What the resurrection is, is it's proof. It's proof that God the Father was pleased with the sacrifice of his son. The resurrection is a demonstration of the power of God over sin and death. The resurrection is true and certain hope that just as Christ was raised from the dead, the Christian will one day too be raised from the dead. So, Here's what we've seen in the gospel. But we're not done yet. But here's what we've seen. God created and owns everything. He is perfectly holy and requires perfect obedience to his law. Anything less than perfect obedience is sin and God can have nothing to do with sin. Man. Man is part of God's created world and man has broken God's law. 
Since man is guilty, he will pay the eternal penalty for sin, which is hell. Man cannot save himself by any amount of good works, and therefore, man, all man, is in a desperate, desperate position. But God provided a solution. Jesus Christ came to this earth as both fully God and sinless man. Jesus demonstrated God's love by dying on the cross to pay sin's penalty, and he rose from the grave and is alive today at the right hand of the Father. But next is our final point, sinners. And maybe maybe even more fully, a sinner's response or sinful man's response. There needs to be a response. We're looking for a response. The good news offers man salvation, forgiveness of sins, peace with God, freedom from guilt, freedom from guilt and shame, hope of a new eternal destiny, and a new spiritual family. Yet, as you know, the stakes are high. It means a break from this world. It means hatred towards anything and everything that is contrary to God and his word. It will mean that you will lose your life for Christ and the gospel. They become all important. They become the essential things of life. They are what you live for. It will put you at odds with family. It will put you at odds with friends. It will change all that you live for and all that you desire. There is absolutely nothing as costly in this world, but you gain everything. To be a partaker of the gospel... First, you must repent of all things that dishonors God. Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return to the Lord. And he will have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. And Jesus says in Luke 9, 23, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. To be a partaker of the gospel, you first must repent of all things that dishonor God, but second, you must believe in Christ as Lord and Savior. Romans 10, 9, you know it. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And we all know that it's not, a, it's not a simple confession of Christ as Savior and that's it. It's the believe in the heart aspect of this verse that really drives it home. The question that must be asked at every turn is, will you repent and believe? God has overlooked times of ignorance, but he is declaring now to all people everywhere, repent. Repent. Acts 17, 30. Saints, this is the gospel. Now, I trust that when you have opportunity to proclaim the gospel, it does not take you 45 minutes. It must be more condensed. But But I would appeal to you that each element should be there. The gospel begins with God who made them and who owns them. And it ends with respond. Please respond. Please respond favorably because this is good news. We are accountable to God who created us. We have sinned against him and will be judged. But God has acted in Jesus Christ to save us. And we take hold of that salvation through repentance from sin and faith in Christ. This is the good news. There is no better news than this, but indulge me for a few more minutes because there is more news. Listen, when you are saved, you are delivered. You are delivered from the domain of darkness and transported into the domain of light. 
I would even say you are not only delivered, you are possessed. You are possessed with the living spirit of God. When you are saved, you are regenerated. You are born again. You are made new. The old heart that you had within you is ripped out and a new one, a fresh one, a clean one was placed within, within you. You are justified. God no longer considers you an enemy with a future destination of hell. God declares you holy because of Jesus' substitutionary death on the cross and one day will grant you access into his glorious heaven. When you are saved, you are united with your savior. God no longer views you apart from his son, but sees you as complete and whole in his son because of his son. You are adopted. You are adopted into God's family before, you are adopted into God's family. Before salvation, you are, you are an enemy of God and a child of the evil one. But now, after salvation, you are a son of the Most High. At salvation, you are given perseverance. God will watch over you, protect you, and keep you. If you are truly his, you will be his for an eternity and will never be lost. And at salvation, you are glorified. At the moment of salvation, you are glorified. You are in part what you will one day be in whole. You will be transformed and given a new body, one that will never get sick, one that will never die. You will then dwell in, his, in this body throughout eternity with all Christians who've ever lived throughout all time. Now, what should our commitment be to this gospel? 1 Corinthians 15, and I already read it, but Paul says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, for I delivered to you as of first importance the gospel. Paul in Romans 9 says, I am telling you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies within me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. As of first importance, we bring the gospel. And our heart aches if it could be so, we would give up our salvation for those who are yet to understand the riches that are found in Christ and Christ alone. Now that really preaches, doesn't it? That hurts. Am I willing to give up my salvation for those who I want to be saved? And notice, Paul is not talking about his children. Paul is not talking about his mom or dad. He is not talking about his brothers or sisters biologically. He's talking about his kinsmen, his countrymen. I could give up the gospel. I could give up the gospel and salvation for my children. But would I give it up for my next door neighbor? For the checkout lady? For the person at the bank? Do we eagerly remind ourselves 
of the gospel? Do you long, do we long to bring the gospel to others? This must characterize us as individuals, but what we are talking about today is the church. Does this characterize TCF? It has to, it must. There are ways that we can improve in our corporate witness in this community. In order for us to be faithful, we must consider those improvements and we must act upon them very soon. And we will. Over the last three weeks, I've put before you our mission statement. What it is that we want to be about. And and most simply, it is exalt God, edify the saints, and evangelize the lost. Those are the things that need to characterize us. Those are the things that we must be committed to. On October 5th, just in a few weeks, the elders are going to be taking a day away to to sit and, and think through, evaluate the ministries of TCF. Before that time and after that time, though, we are going to be talking with the ministry leaders um, about the ministries. Um, We want to find out all that we can and we want to evaluate well. Well, In our evaluation, what we are going to do is we are going to take these building blocks, take the things that we've talked about over these last three weeks and make sure that they, they fit within our mission. What are we trying to accomplish? What do we want to be known as? What do we want to do? Ministries will be restarting. Some ministries may take a break. There may be some ministries that start afresh. But we will use these building blocks to evaluate some of that. And saints, of course, if you have any questions, comments, anything that you want to discuss with the elders, we want you to. We actually, we need you to. Um, I mean, that's part of the reason we did this assigning of elders. Uh, the goal was is that you knew that you had somebody that you could bend the ear of for a time, um, an afternoon, a call, a dinner, whatever it might be. Uh, that's, that's part of this. So if you have any questions, we, we, we want to do that. But the goal of this whole thing is shepherding. We understand as as leaders that we are accountable to God for your souls. We realize that one day we will stand to give an account. And we want to do so believing to the best of our ability that the Lord will look down and say, well done. That's our desire and that is our hope. I'd ask of you that you would pray for October 5th. And I guess I would ask that any moment that you think of anybody in leadership, any of the elders, please pray. If you're in the grocery store at that very moment, drop on your knees and pray. Um, Just joking. But please pray. Please be praying for us. We need wisdom. We need God's word. Um, We need mutual edification. We need you. We need one another. So please pray. And I trust at some level that you have a better idea of what part you play in all of this now than maybe where we first began. I don't, maybe you don't know every, you don't know exactly what it is, that, where it is that you fit in the mix of all this. But what the elders, what I want for you is undistracted devotion to Christ. And I don't just want that on Sunday morning, I want that for you all the time. We long to see within TCF personal holiness, devotion to discipleship, and loving service of one another. We are eager to see TCF as a force for the gospel in the community of St. Louis Park. If we can help you personally in your worship of God, edifying one another or evangelism, the elders really just say, come talk to us, come, come meet with us. But we also know that you have one another, mutual discipleship.
Personally, I'm, I'm very excited about the possibilities. Of course, the Lord is sovereign. He is on his throne. He will guide and direct as he sees fit. Our job is to be godly. Our job is to do what we know scripture demands of us, evangelizing, edifying. And we just want to be worshiping him all the time. May the Lord bless you as you seek to worship him, edify the saints, proclaim the gospel to all who need it. Would you pl- uh, please stand with me as I pray? Most gracious Father, this morning we come before you thankful. Thankful, Father, that at the right time you sent your Son to this earth, both fully God and fully man, to live a perfect life that we, we, we could not live, to die a sinner's death in our place, to be buried but then to raise from the dead, to rise from the dead. And now our Savior is at your right hand. Father, the gospel is precious. It is the good news. It is what we here at TCF desire to be about. Father, we are thankful for you. We are thankful for all that you do. And we are thankful, Father, for this new chapter. Lord, we know that there will be bumps. There will be difficulties and challenges. There always are. But we ask, Father, that we would respond to them in ways, in in, in godly ways. That we would be known as gracious, merciful, and kind individuals that we would be about reconciliation, that we would be eager to do all things that would exalt you, Father. And so as we move ahead, we pray, Father, that you would go before us. We pray that we would be humble saints before you. And as you direct, we would follow And we do pray that you would be glorified with all that takes place here at Twin City Fellowship. And again, Father, we do all things for your glory and honor. Thank you for our Savior. Thank you that you've given us your spirit. It's in our Savior's name we pray. Amen.